crystal, crystal, crystal. What a mess. We're going to start with something more positive, which is some uplifting news from Garcelle and her sister Chantel touring Garcelle's new beach house. Now, this is a legacy for her and her children and a little bit of a vacation house and something she can leave behind. But she shares how big this is for a Haitian immigrant growing up not knowing anyone who owned one home, much less two. Now, they take time to thank their mom for instilling hard work and integrity in them growing up, resulting in all this success. But they end this trip with a short walk to the beach from the lot, reminding Garcelle of the days going to Haitian beaches growing up, dreaming of this one day, which is now a reality. And in this heavy episode, I'm glad they started it off with a scene like this, which I think resonates with everyone in America and also gives hope to those of you around the world who aspire to have this American dream like life. And to me, this scene shows that Garcelle and her family are the epitome of living the American dream despite all obstacles, whether it's race or gender or country of origin. All of that was overcome through hard work and doing the right thing and being a good human. So kudos to Garcelle and her family for all of this success so far and, and a lot more to come. But we then head to dinner with Dorit and Erica where we learn this is actually later in the day from Dorit's therapy session we saw ending last episode. Now, after Dorit shares therapy is difficult but good because she's learning tools to cope with the trauma, plus Erica trying to trying very hard to relate to Dorit in this and also being more hopeful than Dorit at this point, trying to soothe her and ease her mind, conversation quickly turns darker when they are updating us viewers on the state of Lisa Renna's mom, Lois, who appears to only be worsening with her life end imminent. But their dinner ends on a high note with Dorit inviting Erica to the Mexico cash trip where apparently Diana was the one that offered to arrange for the private jet at Sutton's store opening last episode. But Dorit has to, of course, pretentiously abbreviate private jet to PJ. But this is all followed by Erica, of course, having to also point out how much she likes having friends like this with this lifestyle that she doesn't have anymore post Tom Girardi divorce and legal issues. Since last episode scene with PK and Dorit setting up the girls trip, I have been very skeptical if they were actually the ones who planned and hosted or are going to host this trip. And this scene is the first one of many this episode confirming my suspicion or at least giving me some evidence to support my theory that I might be right. But now we are with Kyle and Crystal for lunch where Kyle's mind is with her sister Kathy and niece Paris for Paris's wedding, which is happening in a few days at the time of filming. Crystal, as a friend of Kathy, is like, I know, I text Kathy too, having to remind Kyle that she's she's in, in the in the know and in the, the cool kid group. But after ordering and Crystal pointing out the waitress calling her food choice good over Kyle's, they get right into the whole Sutton versus Crystal flare-up recently stemming from last year's Tahoe trip rough start. I just wanted to quickly point out those two things pointed out by Crystal came off as kind of joke playful, but it's a little bit of foreshadowing, I think, to some later accusations against Crystal. Crystal, though, shares again why she has been triggered recently, because apparently the other girls still don't understand why she's triggered, I guess. But Kyle earned some points with me by calling out Crystal to her face in this private one-on-one -on -one about the bad optics of throwing Sutton under the bus while defending yourself against Garcelle's claim that you were trying to set Sutton up in that conversation to look bad no matter what. And not backing up your feelings on the situation with what was actually said leaves an open-ended, unresolved, uneasy feeling for everyone else. Which at this point, I'm starting to think Crystal, that was actually her intent, was to make this an open-ended, uneasy feeling. But Crystal continues to double down on not wanting to say what Sutton said, coupling that with an, okay, lesson learned. I shouldn't have said anything if I wasn't going to say everything. However, this attempt by Crystal to shut down the conversation she started after being called out by virtually everyone in the group falls on deaf ears to a still confused and upset Kyle, not ready to move on. Adding what we said last week in the last few weeks of Crystal really being the one to gaslight everyone else as she is claiming everyone else is gaslighting her, which Crystal seems shocked at the possibility of this interpretation by Kyle, followed by her telling Kyle to be careful with that. But Kyle still isn't giving in, clapping back, saying, Oh, are we going to be dramatic about that now, too? Where Crystal, of course, says no and asks for the benefit of the doubt. But Kyle adds a caveat of needing Crystal to be more direct and not as passive aggressive, with Crystal adding another caveat of needing others to be open to her feelings 
as long as and she agrees to do the same with others. They end the lunch with light conversation, looking forward to Mexico, surfing with the sharks. At this point, we might as well just call this the real gaslighters and hypocrites of Beverly Hills. But anyways, let's keep going. <laughs> to Kyle, now back at home in quote-unquote Beverly Hills, which Rick and Kelly pointed out on their show that it's actually in Encino, not Beverly Hills proper. But she gets a visit from Diana, who apparently got lost on her way over, blaming her old navigation in her Bentley, where Kyle, of course, had to joke about how cheap the car is, in case you didn't pick up on her sarcasm in her confessional. But Dana Wilkie on her show actually backed up Diana on this one as someone who had owned a Bentley back in the day, saying it did have a bad built-in GPS system. But we also get an update post-nuptials from Kyle of Paris's wedding and her ID, her I do's staying very on brand for Paris. But we also learned that Farah, Kyle's oldest daughter, just got engaged, but had to keep it on the DL during Paris's wedding as to not take attention away from her bride cousin. But Kyle shares she is looking forward to toddlers being in her life again as a grandmother very soon, which leads to Diana sharing updates on her toddler, who is now walking, but also opens up about being pregnant something very dark. This is actually dark, not what Crystal was talking about. This is dark. With a baby boy only months after Eliana, who we've seen, was born, but he ended up dying in the womb at 14 weeks, learning this on FaceTime with Asher from the doctor's office ultrasound uh, appointment. And he had apparently, the baby, been dead in her body for two weeks, which she said was very dangerous to the mother at that point because of possible infection. Now she says she almost bled to death and she actually saw the baby fall out of her, leading her to faint. Now, all this reminded her how fragile life is and how little control we really have. And of course, how devastating that is. But on a more positive note, which is the pattern here to end these very heavy scenes on positives, she says she was given the green light to try for another pregnancy. And she says she, she does want to because she doesn't want her end of her pregnancy years to end on that note. Now, I normally make fun of Kyle for her over-the-top dramatic reactions, but if there is any time for a reaction like this, it is hearing this horrific story from Diana, and it just, it's just hard to, to even hear anything like this from anybody. But now we are with Miss Bouvet dining with Miss Strack, giving us another glimpse into the strange world of Sutton before they talk Crystal Feud, where Sutton seems to be pouring her own drink by transferring ice cubes with chopsticks from one glass to another as Garcelle is watching on in horror and embarrassment at the chance that someone was watching them, which is another relatable real moment between these two and why we stand them and, and support them as the MVPs of the season. But then we get closer to the source of what Crystal was referring to from Tahoe at Sutton's story event, where Sutton shares he and Crystal talked about this quote unquote, over the summer after filming last season as it was airing for us. We learned the story Crystal likely was referring to was never before seen parts of their Tahoe makeup conversation the morning after their first night in Tahoe conversation with Kyle, where Crystal called Sutton that girl that doesn't see color. The story was Sutton sharing a time where her white daughter was playing in their jacuzzi with some black girls, a redheaded Irish Catholic girl, and a Chinese girl, and Sutton thought to herself, this is how it should be. But we see Crystal respond to that story in Tahoe, saying that she doesn't disagree, but says that Sutton needs to go further, and that isn't enough anymore. Now, Garcelle rightfully replies, asking Sutton to help her understand why Crystal would call a bunch of kids in a pool dark. And Sutton rightfully responds, I don't know, but that's all I can think of that she may be referring to. Sutton tries to explain, well, to her, maybe it was bad in the context of the race conversation, but Garcelle confesses there may be missing pieces to this puzzle if Crystal finds it so dark and Sutton finds it so light. And after a final attempt to get Sutton to share anything remotely dark, Garcelle has had enough and says, okay, that can't be it, but if it is, then you need, you need to be careful with Crystal because if she can make that out to be that, that, word, that bad, then that is truly scary and dangerous and that is not a friend. Now first, I think the reason they didn't show that story last season was because it wasn't a big deal to anyone, even Crystal at the time, who said she didn't disagree, which the double negative implies that she actually agreed with Sutton, saying that everyone should be able to play together. Crystal saying, though, that you need to go further and that isn't enough is the textbook quote-unquote woke, for lack of a better term, tactic. They make you bend to them on one thing, 
but will always have more hoops for you to jump through to appease them. Even if Sutton were to bow down, kiss Crystal's feet, give reparations for any, any and everything ever said or done for everyone in the world, past or present, it still would not be enough because the whole woke ideology is about power over people through divide and conquer disguised as perpetual victim entitlement. And I think this new scene shown from last season to us supports Garcelle accusing Crystal of setting Sutton up to fail in that conversation no matter what. Also, what do you expect someone to say when you are alluding to them being racist or racially insensitive? Nothing? So you can have the upper hand on them always? Maybe that's the goal. But I interpreted this comment from Sutton as her appeasing Crystal saying, of course I notice differences in outward appearances, but I don't use that against people or rank peace people based on that. But last point on this for now, I agree with Rick and Kelly, their take on this of not only is Crystal becoming insufferable, annoying, and dangerous with her hyperbole, but also her exaggerating the story to the ladies on a worldwide platform diminishes the suffering of true victims of racism around the world. But before that, if you liked what you've seen slash heard so far, make sure to thumbs up, rate, and or review this episode wherever you are tuning in from to let the platform know you want to see more content like this and to help this episode reach others who may enjoy it as well. But as the girls are getting ready to leave for the trip, we sadly learn Lois, Lisa's mom, passed away on November 15th, 2021 at age 93 in Medford, Oregon, surrounded by her loved ones, where Lisa is recounting the heartbreaking moment she had to decide to not keep her mom alive. This is followed by, though, an uplifting montage in memoriam of Lois on the show over the years, showing why so many people on and off TV loved her. And this ends with Lisa, though, saying how lucky she feels to be an offspring of Lois's light that will shine on in our memory forever. And a respectful, quiet, still transition into and out of Lois's news was followed by Erica and Kyle FaceTiming, unsure if Rena will actually show up for the girls' trip, but hopeful that they can lift her up and distract her in this time should she show up. Now, I know many in my life, after someone passes, are in shock, and it takes a while for things to sink in, that you just kind of want to be around others that are still around, that you love and are close to, and just go do something. Get out of the house, take your mind off of it a little bit, so I think this was actually a genuine friend moment from Kyle and Erica towards Lisa. But now we jump to the girls, including Lisa Renna, meeting at the private airport lounge before departing on the PJ, all comforting Renna, happy to see her joining them with support from Harry and their daughters because they think Lois would want her to be there. Renna also shares her daughters were actually able to have last moments with their grandmother where Dorit shares how special that was for her when she lost her grandmother helping to cope with the loss a little bit better. Erica arrives, of course, misreading the somber room, but quickly corrects after seeing Rena's face, followed by Garcelle arriving to Dorit confessing she hopes Lisa and her have a good trip and lean on each other as they both deal with recent life event trauma. On the plane, Dorit steps up explaining what the plans are for that night, as if she actually planned the trip, which I'm still not convinced she or PK did, but Diana laughing in the corner as Dorit is talking may indicate she knows the truth and might actually support my theory. So after landing, Kyle, Dorit, Diana, and Rinna are in one car, and Kyle calls the other car of Sutton, Garcelle, Crystal, and Erica the awkward car, which I think was actually referring to their relationships to one another being awkward, not necessarily calling them awkward people, unlike what I saw some people online trying to interpret Kyle's comments as mean, including Dana Wilkie. But the awkward car actually gets the last laugh with Garcelle, who can read rooms well, both temperature-wise and shade-wise, predicting Dorit speaking Spanish to the driver in the other car to English responses from him, which actually seems to have the awkward car bond and agree for a change, and they actually showed us footage of Dorit doing exactly that. But before the cast gets to the resort, we get another montage of Diana's stylist arriving to the room first to set Diana up before she arrives to an overpacked closet for the amount of days they will be vacationing. Finally, the girls arrive to the Conrad Resort, which yes, is a Hilton property named after Conrad Hilton, I believe. However, we are without the Hilton of the group, Kathy, at this time because she was still in negotiations to the return to the show with Bravo as a friend of. So maybe she was supposed to be on the trip and that is why the Hilton Resort was chosen. 
I don't know, but it is a very interesting premise to think about. Nonetheless, Erica's wow engulfs their lobby entrance, but I noticed the missing welcome Miss Kemsley and guests, which I would expect if Dorit in fact did book this trip. Yet another piece of evidence supporting my theory, but another in a moment. After Diana scopes out her situation, she checks out the view and the balcony jacuzzi. Rena does her standard wet wipe down of touched surfaces we've seen her do on a number of occasions visiting hotels on the show over the years. And after Kyle FaceTimes Erica from their rooms getting outfits together for dinner at the resort, we're now at dinner. And everyone except for Dorit arrives at first. We will find out in a moment why. But Kyle gets Rena to open up about how she is handling Lois's death so far, sharing the fact that it is her mom is the hardest part, especially when picturing Lois not present when she normally would be in certain events coming up. But they quickly turn to pointing out all the positives of Lois's later life abilities, considering what she went through and her love for being famous, quote unquote, through Lisa, leading to a cheers and a look to the, look to the sky for Lois. But Dorit finally arrives to the table, but a little bit flustered because she was given a ground floor suite with people walking by all the time, making her feel uneasy still after the robbery. This was very confusing to me because I thought having people walking by all the time might be a good thing for someone who is a little bit of, of afraid post robbery because if someone something does happen there's people walking by as your witness also why not say hey i don't need my own room i can go stay with my friend kyle since it isn't a couple's trip and that wouldn't be awkward and then you wouldn't be alone but again this to me shows dorit didn't plan the trip because diana got the presidential suite but dorit got the ground floor i guess the worst suite um, if she and, and or PK actually did plan the trip, then I think they would have arranged for this ahead of time, especially if the real meaning of the trip was to get to read out with her friends to take her mind off the robbery. It just doesn't really make sense. But nice try, Kemsley's and producers, but I'm not buying it. Now, after ordering drinks and food, Lisa doesn't skip a beat delivering the pot stirring assignment she was asked to do by asking everyone, so what did I miss the past week when I was gone? Where Sutton shares her store opening didn't go as well as the picture showed adding that she was also busy that week, but apparently everyone else wasn't busy and they all had a conversation without her, referring to, I think, Crystal's meeting the girls at Kyle's before leaving La Quinta and also the pre-La Quinta meeting at Crystal's, which now looks very suspicious on her part and maybe what prompted Garcelle to call Crystal out. Sutton adds she doesn't want the dark conversation being misconstrued and then is very clear, concise, smart, and careful with her word choice here, saying, we know my character, we know my family values of having a place of love expressed to everyone. She then looks at Crystal saying, I don't want untruths to be spoken. Crystal responds explaining her discomfort with what was said, but again tries to shut it down by pointing out her resolution already with Sutton. But Sutton now is calling out Crystal for unearthing something from one year ago, even though it had already apparently been worked out. But then Crystal adjusts her story again, saying, well, it was the heavy tone that I had the problem with where Dorit pokes Crystal to say the thing she's been referring to because most of the group isn't privy to what Sutton and Garcelle talked about earlier at dinner. Crystal then starts woke explaining that words are like a war shock and Garcelle is like, what does that mean? And everyone tries to help her out, but Crystal then kind of gives up and gives it her reason to say, well, whatever, these are big words, implying everyone else is too dumb to understand her big words and continuing Crystal's streak of coming across very elitist. But Diana jumps in saying, well, maybe Crystal is the youngest in the group and just was naive. I know I was naive at that age, but Dorit isn't having it saying, well, 38 isn't exactly a baby. And there's a difference between 21 and 38. But also Diana points out there is a difference between 38 and 58 too, which I thought was fair. But we return to the main issue where Sutton says she is coming from a place of love, but is nervous to proceed in her friendship with Crystal after multiple character assassination attempts. But again, for the thousandth time, it seems, Erica makes it about herself because she cannot help but get a piece of the Sutton hate train every time it pulls into the station, <laughs> explaining she is in awe of what is happening because Sutton character assassinated her last year. That was quickly shut down as not the same thing by Garcelle after she also confessed that the difference last year was that the entire world was questioning Erica and Sutton was not intentionally trying to assassinate her character like it appears Crystal is trying to do this year where Dorit steps up again asking Crystal if maybe she exaggerated or made stuff up. But of course, Crystal turns victim again, saying, well, I was hurt by what was happening, so stop denying my experience. 
And after Kyle comes from left field sharing with the entire group what she told Crystal in private earlier about Crystal gaslighting everyone and Crystal trying to shut it down again, Erica steps in trying to get more clarity on what Sutton thinks Crystal is doing, bluntly asking, okay, you don't want Crystal insinuating you are a racist. Followed by Lisa, Erica, and Sutton agreeing, the vague statement leaving us to fill in the blanks with worst case scenarios is already bad enough for Sutton. And I would argue it's actually even worse. But I think, like I said earlier, that is why Crystal is being vague because the cut and dry facts don't support her recounting of events and would backfire against why she probably brought this up in the first place. But now a pissed off Sutton, knowing she didn't say anything wrong or bad, is greeted by Crystal now trying to gaslight everyone again, saying, well, I didn't actually bring it up. But Sutton, thank goodness, is not letting Crystal get away with this, saying sternly, yes, you did. You did bring it up, and it continues to be a pattern with you and your friends of making up lies about your friends behind their back, and you need it to stop because I like you. <laughs> and I love this because Sutton was throwing the vague accusations back at Crystal's face, which she clearly, clearly didn't like, which is funny how that works when you don't like what other people are treating you as, even though that's what you've been treating them like. But Sutton adds in her confessional, Crystal will do anything within a friend group in society, not just on the show, to get closest to the most powerful person in the group, even if it means stepping on everyone else. And this may be supporting my theory last week of Crystal wanting to be friends with Garcelle and trying to attack Sutton with something she thinks Garcelle would end her friendship with Sutton over being the race conversation, but I think it backfired. Also, Rena confessed too, she had heard this about Crystal as well, but decided not to use it in the group, which was an interesting choice of words as pointed out by the Morning Toast recap of this. And I think it was a little bit of an insight, wink, wink, to the inner workings of the show as basically social warfare. But Dana Wilkie seemed to think Teddy Mellencamp, who was Crystal's friend referring her to the show, who ended up being Teddy's replacement may have been the one to tell the others about Crystal's behavior in society as sort of a subtle dig at and an indication that she may be jealous that she was replaced by her friend Crystal, who she recommended. Also, I did see Crystal on the red carpet for the MTV Awards recently, name dropping. So I'm not surprised by the social climbing accusation against Crystal. Also, we have to remember she came in as Kathy Hilton's friend, who Kathy seems to have the most leverage over this show and and this group so kind of all adds up i'm just gonna say that but kyle steps up again saying i'm not trying to go back or have problems with you crystal but i was present for that conversation and things still do not add up where crystal all of a sudden doesn't want to go back in time and wants everyone to move forward saying well kyle if you don't want to go back in time then move forward which it's too late for crystal because she opened this can of worms and she cannot play victim here it is all on camera for all of us to see. This leads to Crystal confessing she thinks Kyle is choosing to focus on what served her and not what was actually important in that situation. Again, Crystal telling someone else how they should feel, the opposite of how Crystal says she wants to be treated, saying Kyle doesn't understand how this could be hurtful to me or people of color, insinuating now that Kyle is the racist with a smile on her face. I guess Crystal is just going to try calling everyone at the table a racist until something sticks to get her social justice gold medal in the media and the public's eye. But what she does not see is she is actually coming off as the race baiting, manipulative, dark, problematic, desperate, confused, mentally ill racist in this situation. And she is continuing the textbook play by wokesters of changing the rules mid game of now it all of a sudden being about the tone, not actually the words, because the tone is a personal interpretation and very hard to disprove now that she has been exposed. Finally, the girls are filled in about the pool party story from Sutton we heard earlier told to Garcelle where Kyle confesses, oh, now I see it was actually something said the next day when I wasn't present, but Sutton did tell me about it later on. Crystal confirms that was what she was referring to, unlike on Watch It Happens Live, which we will get to in a moment, where Garcelle says, no, I did not think that was dark or problematic. My problem is actually, I'm more triggered by you interpreting it that way, leading to Crystal shutting down and giving a very defeated, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to Sutton, but Sutton isn't having it saying, no, thanks a lot. Thanks for making this huge mess for me and making it all this big deal. You can't be sorry now. It's already out of the bag. And I think in that moment, I can read Crystal's face as kind of an, oh shit, Garcelle isn't even backing me up on this one. But it appears Crystal is continuing to spiral 
to you this day as highlighted by her Watch It Happens Live appearance after this episode. But before we get into that, one quick final thought on this episode. I hope this last scene means we have turned the corner where people are no longer afraid to speak up about race-related things when they think, think things are going too far. That's all I want to say to wrap that part up. But now to Crystal's Watch What Happens Live appearance. Besides every viewer poll being a landslide against Crystal and Andy being slightly uncomfortable sitting there having Crystal watch these returns come in live, literally feet away from him. These polls included the audience disagreeing with her word choice regarding the pool story and her interpretation of it. But she also said on this episode, well, Sutton actually said something else that was dark and problematic other than the pool story, meaning the conclusion on the show isn't the story Crystal is now sticking with in reality. Not quite sure what she's trying to pull off here. Maybe she's going to bring something out at the reunion, or maybe she really is mentally off or pushing some sick agenda out of desperation. I don't know, but clearly she didn't actually learn the lesson as she told Kyle at their lunch earlier about hinting at something but not being willing to say what it actually is. This also supports my theory earlier about there always being something else with this type of person. Speaking of Kyle, Crystal basically called her stupid for calling her out on the gaslighting because apparently Crystal thinks, in her mind, she was not gaslighting and that Kyle just doesn't know what that means. Wrong. Kyle was right in the situation. Everyone's basically gaslighting everybody at this point. But on the Watch It Happens Live after show, Real Housewife of Dubai, Chanel Ayan, called her castmate Nina Ali a social climber as Crystal is sitting next to her post-episode where she was called a social climber, which I thought was just completely ironic, but they didn't really catch it in the moment uh, on the show. But before we get into the ratings of it all, uh, Perry Sanders from Sherelle's World reminded us of something from last season that Crystal confessed which was her saying growing up she wanted to be blonde with blue eyes because she was always around white skinny girls with blonde hair and blue eyes. So maybe her focus on Sutton is her envy and inner like child coming out and she's choosing Sutton versus let's say the other blonde and blue eyed Dorit, Erica, and Diana because she sees Sutton as the weakest of them all and also supports maybe she sees those other three as more powerful and she can social climb with them. Also, this may be part of her self-esteem issues connected to her eating disorder, which also coincides with her issue last year in Tahoe with Sutton. And now it is all coming to a head here, warping her interpretation and mindset to come across irrational to basically everybody. But finally, on the ratings front, live viewership slipped back to the season premiere number of 1.15 million down from last episode's season high of 1.18 million. Last season, episode four to five also dropped, but only by 10,000 viewers versus this season, a 30,000 viewer drop. But this season still is above last season's episode five live viewership of 1.08 million. I also wanna make a correction from last week's episode ratings recap, where I said the 1.18 million wasn't reached until episode 13 of last season. In reality, it was reached in episode 6, but they dipped after that until episode 13, returning to that high before climbing from there as more Erica revelations came out during filming. But even so, this season still reached that number two episodes early and seems to be holding on to the viewership growth season to season and holding on to viewership better than last season. So with that said, thank you so much for tuning in for this recap of episode 5. Hope you will join me in the next one, and as always, click around the channel for more. Thank you so much for having me in your online life, and I will see you next time.